All right. Hello, uh, church family. And uh, just to guess a quick update on us, we're alive. So that's good. <laughs> um, we, we, uh, we, we've all had COVID go through us and uh, I think we're going to come out. I don't know if stronger is the right word, but we're going to come out <laughs> out of this anyway. Um, and do, I really appreciate uh, all the prayers and, and phone calls and text messages and things that folks have sent our way. Um, it's meant a lot and I just encourage you to keep praying. Um, so as far as church next Sunday, um, honestly, that, that's still going to be up in the air for right now. I want to wait and see what, um, at least what the week brings and what, uh, if any new uh, restrictions come from the governor. Uh, but if you are wanting to, uh, or not wanting to be out, I would encourage you to stay home. Um, you know, things are, I think we're going to see the numbers keep going up for a while here. <clears throat> and I want to be able to make uh, safe choices for us and all that, but uh, we'll, we'll see what the week brings. So we'll let you know, hopefully <clears throat> around Thursday or Friday or so, we'll just kind of let you know what our decisions are. Um, and, uh, so for that, let's go ahead and get into God's word tonight. Uh, well this morning uh, I'm recording it at night, I guess. Um, but it's Thanksgiving is this week and I wanted to do uh, a message about Thanksgiving and I had been reading through first Timothy and maybe it's because it's Thanksgiving time and these verses were jumping out at me, but there, there's several, I, I think, significant passages in first Timothy that talk about giving thanks. And I don't know if I really noticed just what an emphasis uh, first Timothy has on uh, uh, an emphasis on giving thanks. Um, so I want to look at a couple of passages where th this word appears in First Timothy and and kind of get the overall message of the book. I, I was joking with my family that I was going to preach through the whole book of First Timothy, and that was partially true. We're go going to hit a few verses, but we'll kind of see the whole um, highlight of the book, the a summary of the book, because... Like I said, I, I hadn't really noticed just how much of a book of thanks it is. You know, Philippians is known as being a, a, a thank you letter, and it was a thank you letter from uh, Paul to the church at Philippi. But there is a lot of emphasis on being thankful and having gratitude and contentment in First Timothy uh, as well. Um, so what do we have to be thankful for this year? Um, this is a year where we have had a uh, pandemic, and we are in the second wave of that now, it seems like. Uh, we have had uh, a lot of ups and downs this year, a lot of things canceled, a lot of disappointment. Um, we have had a, a very contentious election, uh, as, as we feared it would be, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of things have gone on this year. Uh, but I, I think at times like this, it is more, it is so important to, to give thanks during times like this than during um, times when, when times are good. Uh, you know, let's think for a moment what the Apostle Paul has went through when he was writing these letters. Um, he had gone through some missionary journeys. He had been arrested. He had been beaten. He had been shipwrecked. He had been... Um, hungry, he'd been cold, he'd been abandoned, he'd been left for dead, he'd been stoned, he'd been whipped. Uh, his body, as he says in 1 Corinthians, his body bears the marks of his ministry, uh, that all, all those things that he went through, and his, his body has paid quite the price for it. And yet, we find him time and again uh, expressing gratitude and encouraging thanksgiving and wanting people to remember and wanting Christians especially to be thankful because there is danger in not being thankful. And so I want to, I want to encourage all of us to be thankful this year uh, for what God has done and continues to be doing for us. Uh, 
And so uh, as we look at the, the theme of thankfulness in 1 Timothy, um, first of all, we see that Paul was thankful for his relationship to the gospel. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12 through 17, and I have the, uh, the videos working, I have the, the Bible passage here up, up here on the screen. And it says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Uh, now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, so the Apostle Paul, as he, he writes to his son in the ministry, Timothy, he is thankful to the Lord. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who's, who ha has enabled me. He, he gave Paul the strength to do what God called him to do. He is thankful for his appointment to God's service. Uh, God, he says, God counted me faithful. He considered me to be faithful, and he put me in the ministry. And I like that Paul's qualification here is not based on talent. It's not based on the ability to perform or that he had, uh, you know, a long list uh, of, uh, of a resume that was impressive. But no, what God found to be acceptable, what God um, counted on and what, or what God wanted was his faithfulness. And so he says that God considered me faithful. And so he appointed him to God's service, and Paul was thankful for that. And we get a little bit, uh, again, and I don't want to linger on these verses. Um, I mean, this this is a whole sermon on, on its own here, but uh, the, the description of Paul, he says, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So he's experienced the mercy of God. And Paul, I think, is thankful for that as well. Uh, he Look at what it says here about who he was. He was a blasphemer. He, he blasphemed God. He persecuted the church. He was an insolent man, uh, but he was able to receive mercy. <clears throat> um, he explains his appointment in verse 14, that appointment to the gospel. It says, And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant, with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. So we, he's experienced God's mercy. He's now experienced God's grace. And his grace, he said, was exceedingly abundant. It was more than sufficient, more than enough. Um, you know, this week we're hoping, uh, Lord willing, we'll all enjoy a delicious uh, Thanksgiving meal on Thursday uh, and I know a lot of us aren't going to be able to do that with our families, but, um, you know, maybe uh, in our homes we're, we'll be able to have a good meal. And I plan to eat exceedingly abundantly more than I'm able, I think. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, but that's like, you know, the grace of God here that it, it, just fills us up to the point where we're stuffed full and we, we couldn't take any more. And Paul says, um, God's grace is like that, that we, that it is exceedingly abundant. It was more than enough for us. And that is truly a wonderful gift that God has given us. And I think Paul is thankful for that because of how it connects him to the gospel and to his calling. And in all of this, he says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering, 
as a pattern to those who are going to be going to believe on him for everlasting life. So uh, Paul says, I obtained mercy so that Christ would be able to show his long suffering. Because remember, he was a blasphemer. He was an indolent man. Um, he, he was a sinner. And yet God called him and considered him faithful and put him in the ministry, enabled him for ministry. And he's able to do this now because of God's mercy and his grace. And people can look at Paul and say, look at the long suffering, mercy and grace of God and of Jesus Christ, because look at what God is doing with Paul. And that's the same thing he can do with you uh, and with me. And this causes Paul to break out into uh, a doxology or a, a words of praise. He says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And uh, I think if, if we had our our lungs working in at full capacity maybe we could sing that song for you uh but you know that that one is uh, that we sing uh we've sung before at church um but that uh that quotes this verse that god who is eternal immortal invisible uh god only wise um uh, it's a great song and what everything that god has done for for paul has caused paul to break out in words of praise and so Paul is thankful for his relation to the gospel. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so what is our response to God's grace and his mercy in our life? Uh, that God has enabled me and is enabling me for this ministry and for the ministry that you have, whatever it is in, the, in your local church, God enables you to do that. Uh, that God gives you the ability to do that. Would he look at you and would he look at me and would he find us to be faithful and would he find us to be grateful for him now let's again remember what paul says i thank christ jesus our lord uh, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful does god count us faithful um, you know as long as we are drawing breath we have an opportunity to be faithful and if we're not faithful we can change God gives us that chance because he is long-suffering, because he is merciful and gracious. So as you give thanks to God this week, give thanks to him for his goodness, his grace, his mercy, his long-suffering, that he has enabled you to do what God has called you to do. Uh, and we're all called to do many different roles and many different activities in both our personal life in our public life, in our church life. What has God called you to do? How can you be faithful to him in that? Uh, secondly, Paul set, has thanksgiving uh, for others. We look down in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. He says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So we are to give thanks for each other. And Paul uh, exhorts in this passage, he, he commands, he, he says, I exhort you, first of all, that all Basically, we are to pray. And this section speaks about uh, uh, praying and praying publicly and how we're going to pray and, and who we should pray for and, and all those things. But he says that you make supplications, that you, you uh, go to the Lord to ask for things, that you make prayer, that you communicate to God, that you make intercession. Um, this is a huge part of our prayer life to intercede on someone's behalf. Uh, this is what we do when we gather together as a church and pray, uh, when we pray for one another, when we share those prayer requests so that we are able to, go, to intercede for one another before God. And he says, giving of thanks be made for all men. And we have the word for thanksgiving again, that we give thanks for 
all men. And what Paul means here is everybody. And he clarifies that in the following verses. And um, I think just because of the the recent uh, election and things here, I think this is a good passage to remind ourselves that it says when he means all men, he means all men, even kings. He says for for kings and all who are in authority uh, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. So for our our leaders, for our for people who are in authority, we are to pray for them, make supplications on their behalf, intercede for them, and give thanks for them. Um, you know, that's a hard one. Um, and, you know, we could we could talk about the way the election has gone and whether we like that or not. And, you know, it doesn't matter here. What What's clear is that God is calling us to pray for our leaders, whoever they may be. And so we need to do this for the president. Uh, and we need to do this for uh, for the uh, president-elect Biden, uh, because this is what God has called us to do, be- so that not that we can stage a rebellion and overthrow, uh, you know, overthrow the government or whatever, but He says so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So we are to pray and give thanks in our prayers. Uh, for all, all men, all people, whether they're in authority or not, for the purpose being that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and reverence, so that our prayers ought to result in our spiritual maturity and not necessarily in um, yeah, political victory uh, or anything like that. Um, that may happen, it may not, but our purpose ought to be so that we can live a peaceful life in godliness and holiness. And that's what God has called us to do, to give thanks. Have you ever thought about that? By giving thanks for someone, by praying for someone, that you can change the world because you have prayed for someone or you have expressed gratitude for someone. Uh, so our purpose is so that we may live at peace and to honor God. Because he says, God in verse 4 says, or, well, excuse me, verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the, in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that knowledge, and what truth is he speaking of? Well, he could go on in verse 5, that there is one God and one mediator between God, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And Paul brings it back again. You know, I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying. <laughs> he says, uh, this is the truth. And he gets pretty passionate about this. But it all begins back to that idea of being thankful and giving thanks for all men and praying for them, making supplication, interceding for them. Uh, When we pray, are we expressing gratitude for one another? Uh, It can be tempting to to pray and uh, desire, you know, that God would strike our enemies dead or that God would would get get the bad guys, you know, that would would, he would strike down sinners and and destroy destroy all evil everywhere and you know the day will come when he does that but rather pray that way we should pray for perhaps mercy on our enemies and grace to be shown to our enemies and to express for those people who are in leadership positions and uh, our, our government leaders to pray for them that God would intercede in their life because it is God's desire that all come to know him as savior uh, and that I, I see what I see here is that we can have the, the best and most significant impact that we can have on our world is through prayer and having this this quiet and peaceful life uh, that is full of godliness and holiness that God desires us to have. Uh, rather than per- trying to become a warrior or a rebel, perhaps we can become a prayer 
or a peacemaker. And that, again, through prayers of thanksgiving, I believe we can truly make a, a change in our world uh, as we follow in prayer, in the prayer that God has designed us to, to pray and to live the life that God wants us to live. Uh, so then um, Paul will talk more about um, different parts, uh, different roles in the church. And uh, he talks about the qualifications of pastors and, and then deacons and and that he warns us then if we, as we come to chapter four, that there's a great apostasy coming. He warns us of the time. And I want to read chapters uh, chapter four, verses one through five. He says, now the spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So Paul is telling the church, basically, here's how you function. Okay, he was talking about prayer. He's talking about the roles of pastors and deacons and uh, and the different roles of, of men and women in the church. And now he's saying, okay, now that you know what to do, you need to be prepared because there are time coming when there is going to be some who depart from the faith. Well, what does this have to do with giving thanks? Well, it, it gets to that. If you follow this train of thought, um, some will de depart from the faith. And he tells us that in verse one, they will give heed. They will listen to deceiving spirits uh, here, probably not like demons in this case, but um, people who come or perhaps people who are being controlled by um, a deceptive spirit and doctrines of demons. So, he said, basically, these things are going to be doctrines, teachings of demons, but they're still going to lead people away from the faith. So some will depart from the faith. Uh, have you ever seen people do that where, where they've gone out of, they've left the faith, they've departed, they've turned back from what they know to be right uh, because of perhaps they were deceived uh, by doctrines of uh, false doctrines and false teaching, and they were deceived. Um, verses 2 and 3, uh, this is how they will be led away. By people speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So what's going to happen is there's going to be these false teachers who will speak lies. They will deceive. They will have basically no conscience at all, uh, that their conscience will have been seared with a hot iron. And we can look in Colossians to get, or uh, Ephesians to get more description of that. Um, but they will uh, speak in hypocrisy uh, again, and they, uh, again, uh, verse three, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods. That's um, some of it's kind of a cultural thing that they were dealing with at the time. But we could also see that today that there's going to be a, um, you know, a, a new understanding of, of perhaps some some see this as uh, a, a new understanding of, of what marriage is or um, people saying that this food is kind of food is wrong but this is the kind of food that's right. And God doesn't want us to do this. He wants us to do that. Um, when, and what Paul says is everything that God has created is good. But there are going to be come false pe teachers who are basically say what God created was not good. And you need to do it my way. <laughs> uh, so we need to be aware and alert of, of people who will come to to destroy the church, who will pull the church apart because they are being deceptive, they are speaking lies, and they've had their own consciences se seared with a hot iron. And unfortunately, those who follow them will, will follow the same pattern. The truth is, and here we're, here's where we get to Thanksgiving. In verse 4, For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. 
where it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. And so specifically what the church was dealing with at the time was food that had been offered to idols that uh, they were able to buy in the marketplace at a cheaper discount uh, rate. But that offended some church people because the, the food had been offered to idols. So they thought that they were, in a sense, supporting the, the idolatry and supporting the, um, you know, the food market for, for idols. I find it funny that the food that was offered to idols then is sold cheaper on the market because, you know, the gods never ate it. <laughs> it just sat there. And so instead of go going to waste, they decided, well, we can sell it at a cheap price to the to the peasants and, and you know, we'll get some extra money out of it. Uh, and I, I find that funny because, I mean, obviously their, their gods were not true uh, and did not actually eat the food. Anyway, all that to say... That was one of the um, food-related um, debates going on in the early church. And another one would be also the, uh, the, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians and the clashes they would have because the Jewish Christians thought that, um, you know, they still had to follow the dietary laws of, of uh, the Old Testament. And, and God says, no, that's all fulfilled now. But So there is some debate on that as well. Basically, what Paul is saying is, if God created it, it's good uh, if it is received with thanksgiving. Paul's problem is the food that we might receive without being thankful. Uh, that, you know, that's where I think it comes from. Um, this all goes back to, what does this have to do now with false teachers? <laughs> I think following those false teachers um, began here in verse 4 when they stopped being thankful for what they had. They stopped being thankful for simple things like their food. They started saying, well, maybe there are some things here that are bad that God created. There are things here that aren't that uh, we need to withdraw from. Uh, and uh, so they began to be unthankful. They began to be dissatisfied. And then perhaps those deceiving spirits and people came into the church and said, you know, the same old temptation. Hey, God is keeping good stuff away from you. Come over to our side. Look what we have here. You know, look what we're doing over here. This is what's good. And they deceive the church away from what's true. Uh, and this is a warning for us today to, to remember that there will come um, deceiving spirits and people who are preaching and teaching and speaking of doctrines that are basically doctrines of demons. They will speak lies. They will be hypocrites. They will have their own consciences seared. They will... Um, want to um, undermine what God says is good. They will want to change what God says is good to something bad. But it all begins because we're not satisfied. We take it all the way back again to Adam and Eve. I think the root of the problem is that they were not satisfied with what God gave them. They wanted something else. And that's where it all begins. So you might not think that you're going to end up being a false teacher just because you ate something without being thankful for it. Uh, but how often, do, how often does sin lead us to places we never thought it would take us? Uh, the truth is, everything created by God is good if it's received with thanksgiving. Whether it's much or whether it's little. Whether it's um, popular or not. The big, well, one of the big problems with our world is that we have lost the ability to be content. Uh, we are led astray by false teachers and by seductive teachers. We're not content with God's plan for us. It may be God's plan for us to not always have it our way. Uh, it may be that it's God's plan for us to experience hardship and to experience trials so that our faith, as we're learning in James, that our faith is made stronger. So this week, give thanks to God, but learn to be content. And then that uh, brings me to my final point in uh, chapter 6. The word thanksgiving isn't used here, but it's teaching and the teaching of contentment is very much uh, on display. Uh, first 
Timothy chapter 6 and verses 3 through 10 it says, If anyone teaches otherwise, um, uh, in other words, uh, other, other than what's true, and, and Paul had been teaching about truth, um, uh, but if anyone teaches anything else, he says, and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. And here's where I get the more of the idea that ultimately false teachers are led astray because they are dissatisfied. They're looking at godliness as a means of gain that I'm not satisfied with what God's given me. And if I do this, or if I change my message, if I don't preach the gospel, we'll get more people into our church. And if I don't preach the gospel, you know, we'll get, as I, like I said, we'll get more people, we'll get to be more, more popular, um, you know, all the, all those things. Uh, but there's a, a, an extreme danger for to a church that chooses to ignore God's word. Uh, he says that, they suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Uh, you know, this is strong, strong command here that those people who are proud, who know nothing, but are obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, those people who are, especially those teachers who are destitute of the truth, who try to use godliness to gain something in their life for themselves, um, those people... Paul says, withdraw from them because, in verse 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. Um, into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. <laughs> that sounds like a threat, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, but he, he's right. If, if we have food and clothing with these, we shall be contempt. And, and he talks about the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and um, we won't take the time to go into all of that. Um, but I want, I want to meditate on that for a moment. Um, godliness with contentment is great gain. That we are to withdraw from people who use godliness to try to gain something for themselves and learn to be content with what we have. It may not be a lot. It may be very little, in fact. But be content with what God has given you. Uh, how did God take care of Israel in the wilderness? He gave them manna. Now, did he give them buckets and buckets full of mannas that they had so much at the end of every day that they were able to store it up and, and can it for a later, later date or that they were eating themselves sick every day? Um, no, what they had was enough for that day. They had manna for that day. And, and then that night it was gone. And when they tried to um, store manna, it would rot and there would be worms in it. And it would, by the next day, it would be gone. But God wanted them to learn faith. God wanted them to learn to trust him. And I think that's a lesson he is teaching us today. That things may not always go our way and things may be difficult. And they will be. We may not have the best. We may not have the most. We may not have, you know, all the power, but that's okay. Because do we have what God has given us? Then we can learn to be content. Because when we're not content, it leads us on the path, I think, to false teaching and to be discontent with what God has given us. So we can learn to be content even with a little even with a small thing, a small amount. Um, this is a hard lesson. And he says here that, especially those who are rich, that this is a very difficult lesson. But as I've said before, even people in poverty can still make money be an idol. Are we content with the little that God has given us, the, the sufficient amount of what God has given us? I think is a better way to put that. Because God has given us what we need for, for, uh, for godliness, 
He's given us enough for today. And let us be satisfied with that. And so uh, this this year we have so much to be thankful for. Um, I you know I'm I'm thankful that my family we're all here around my ta- the table tonight, and we are um, more or less healthy, <laughs> probably probably less uh, than more, but uh, we're here together, and and I'm grateful for that. Uh, and I look forward to being back together with uh, you church folks um, as soon as we can and, and can do so safely. Um, but this year, as I, I seem to encourage every year, because it's, it's <laughs> I mean, it's important, but give thanks to the Lord. Do it in ways that are meaningful and heartfelt. He may have given us a little. And I think, you know, a lot of us are going to be experiencing um a little this year during Thanksgiving, uh, you know, instead of having the big family get togethers, we might just have to have a, a small one in our homes. And that's fine because I think God should be the focus point there uh, and give him the glory for what he has done for us. Um, Paul is so thankful for God. He, God put him in ministry. Paul's thankful for that. God has given him fellow brothers in Christ. And Paul is thankful for that. And, and for all people, he's thankful for leaders, for followers, for the servants of the Lord. He is thankful for them all. Paul was thankful uh, for all that God has made. Um, we saw in chapter 4. Uh, and he for God's provision of his daily needs in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, we can say those same, same things, that God has been good to us. He's given us our daily provisions. He has given us all that we have. He's given us one another. Uh, And he has called us to this wonderful ministry here in Walnut to bring out the word of God. Uh, And it's sure been a rough year for this, but um, God's word keeps going out. And uh, we can be thankful for that. Um, So that's uh, all I have for today. Uh, You folks take care. uh, And I... Hope to see you again soon, and God bless you.